Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Five Drinks Through Midnight. You know the show, we bring the questions, guests bring the drinks, we try to wrap up before midnight. Today we're headed down to Omori Margo to talk to Southern Tea, Beverage Director of Overthrow Hospitality. But before we do, like and subscribe, it'll really help us out. Let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Five drinks or midnight? Five drinks, five questions, midnight, awesome. whatever comes first. Thank you so much for having us. How you doing today, sir? I'm well, and I'm excited to get into this. Excellent. So. excellent. I guess so the first question we have is, what are we drinking? Uh, we starting off with something a little bit lighter, more aperitif style. We call this one the Brawley O'Cano. Uh, we have two versions of this drink on the menu, actually, but the, this is the original. It is simply Braulio in place of Campari and uh, Coqui Rosa, a rosé uh, aperitif wine in place of sweet vermouth, uh, and then lit up with some seltzer water. Awesome. Uh, we offer it longer as well, where we add rum to it. Okay. It still, still carries the same name. Well, figured, we got five drinks. Let's start light. <laughs> Cheers. Easy well, drinking. Then I guess, you know, just jumping into the first question, it's a little bit of an origin story, but you were a butcher, a chef, professor and now how'd you get into the bar business uh you know it's uh, i think a lot of it was accidental um and some of it in the end makes a lot of sense uh i was i left home at the tender age of 17 i grew up in florida and i've lived in 12 states so just traveling around i picked up a lot of different skills and a lot of different perspectives um, and then uh, uh, I went to culinary school, then I became a, uh, uh, and, and worked years in the, in the kitchen, and then I became a culinary school instructor at the New England Culinary Institute up in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, I was also, prior to going up there, I, was, I worked in butcher shops, so I taught butchery at the school. Uh, and then when I moved to New York, sight unseen, I had never been here, uh, I, I rented my apartment over the phone. I didn't know even neighborhoods or anything. Uh, and my first inclination was to get a job in a restaurant as a waiter so that I could make some fast cash and have a maybe lenient schedule and find out about the city uh, and the first place that I went into to apply for a job I ran into a former colleague of mine who uh, had been the major D uh, for Susan Spicer uh, and uh, Donald Link at Herb Saint in New Orleans when I lived in New Orleans I worked for Susan Spicer uh, and he quizzically looked at me and thought you're not coming to cook at this restaurant because it wasn't that same caliber. Great place. Uh, and I said, no, actually, I'm looking for a service job for the reasons I just described, but I'll stay with you for at least six months. I'm not going to screw you over. And he said, well, can you bartend? And I said, his name was Alex. I said, Alex, I've been putting beautiful food on a plate for a, a decade. I think I can put a beautiful drink in a glass. And he gave me that job. And I again promised him I'd stay for six months. I stood behind that bar for three years because it's such a translatable skill. Uh, it's still all about ergonomics, mise en place, uh, uh, production, creativity, uh, all the things transfer. Uh, and then one thing is pretty shockingly different, and that's the thing that I think held me behind that bar, was I'm not just facilitating the experience, I am part of it. Whereas, you know, I used to live behind the double doors and those plates go out that door, I don't know if there's even literally anyone out there. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, you know, the, the chef nightmare of uh, your whole life is services taking those plates out and they're just scraping them into a garbage can. There's nobody even out there. You know, they bring some of them back with some stuff on them and some without and you're just like, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, sh it's a sham. We're living in the metaverse. Um, so I can be as much of the experience as the guest wants. I can, um, you know, if they want to engage me and talk to me about every little ingredient in the cocktail, I can engage. If they want me to drop the drink and walk away, I can do that as well. So that's what held me behind the bar. Awesome, man. And then uh, from there, then how to coming to opening up here, and then also now becoming beverage director for an empire, if you will. We're building, yeah. Um, so I think that my first opportunity behind that bar led me to the place where 
I got a great chance to be explorative, right? Uh, it was a more broad stroke bar, so we had kind of everything. And at first, I ingratiated myself to the actual chef that was there. Uh, and I was like, hey, this is, this is a seafood restaurant. I said, this is a seafood restaurant. I see lemons all over the plates, but we buy concentrated lemon juice for the bars. Can I just squeeze my own juice? He was very happy about that. And then so that slowly became all the juices we did in-house. And then I said, you know, I'm kind of bored, and I'm a chef too. Can I come back here and make my own grenadine? Because I noticed this bottle of grenadine doesn't say the word pomegranate anywhere, right? Roses. Um, so I started making grenadine. I started making uh, a, you know, ginger beer. I started making all manner of different syrups for the bar and really exploring um, and doing a lot of research, going to uh, you know, the library to find cocktail books is you know, kind of pre-internet accessibility um, and digging around on blogs that I could find at that time. You know? uh, and then I realized more and more my palate leaned to a certain direction. You know. Just like in the kitchen, I was a savory chef. I didn't really lean down the sweet avenue. My tastes are the same in the bar. So I noticed that I was more interested in drinks that were stirred, not shaken. Didn't have any juice or sugar in them. Made with uh, all alcohol. Then I discovered Amari, bitters, vermouths, you know, like, and then I started exploring each of those categories. And around my 10 year mark of bartending, I left that bar and worked at other bars as well. Many, in fact. Um, uh, but but again, always kind of leaning down the same road. And so when the opportunity came around to start a small business that only did that, for me as a former chef, it made sense. And the way I explain that is you wouldn't want to join me for dinner at a restaurant that claims to serve sushi and tacos and spaghetti. A little bit scattershot. Yeah. You'd be much more inclined to join me at a place that only serves spaghetti because they're probably doing it well. So I started thinking about how I would approach a bar of my own, and I thought, I don't want to serve everything. I want to serve kind of one thing really well. So here at Amore Margo, we don't use any juice. The only sugar we use is cane syrup from Martinique, and we only use it in old-fashioned cocktails. Um, everything here is alcoholic. My only non-alcoholic ingredient is water. And I have flat, frozen, or bubbly. Right? There's a bubbly <laughs> water and some frozen water in this drink right here. Um, <clears throat> And we excel at that, and we do it in a very small room, and we delight people, and we, we crush it because we are hyper-focused. Uh, and then, as I've opened other bars, we've done a similar thing. Um, the pandemic took away a couple of them from me, but I had a bar called Blue Quarter, and at Blue Quarter, every cocktail involved tea. So we had a tea component, you know, uh, tea smoking, tea syrups, tea infusions, uh, tea ice cubes, you know, some tea made its way into every cocktail. Uh, I opened a place called Windmill. Windmill, uh, my partner there was French, uh, Pierre Moulin, which means Peter Windmill. <laughs> so we called it Windmill. Uh, and everything on that bar was French. You know, Citadel Gin, rums from Martinique, uh, lots of chartreuse. Um, and, uh, you know, then we opened Honeybees. Honeybees was all American whiskey only. Okay. Currently, we've opened Ateria, which is only tequila and mezcal. Um, you know, I don't even have another bottle of spirit on that bar. Um, so if you're going there, that's what you're getting. <clears throat> and we try and like, make it a little bit more immersive, you know? You may say to yourself, I'm craving a hamburger, but you may have wandered into a, a sushi place. Get on board with the sushi. Yep. This is what they do here. If you ask them to make you a hamburger, they might try, and it will not be good for them or for you. Yep, that would be <laughs> a terrible experience. For everybody, right? So I like to be a little bit more focused. Okay. Um, and so Amori Margo was born out of that notion, and then the subsequent bars have been as well. And then, uh, two, uh, do you guys have the largest collection of Amaro? Is I mean, that... I like to think so. Uh, we got whittled down because of the pandemic and we're still building back up. You know, it's uh, still ongoing, the pandemic. Um, I think that there was a point when I, when I could have boasted that easily. Okay. I think I could still at least be in some tight running. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, um, we stopped a lot of frivolous spending. <laughs> I don't know what to call it, um, yeah. and a lot of those things got whittled away and they just aren't back yet, gotcha. but I'll have them back. I, I could probably easily say I have the most uh, tincture bitters. I have over 500 tinctures, uh, and then we've hovered uh, uh, up over 320 potables. Okay. But right now, the list is a little bit tighter. All right. And then, too, you, uh, I've read that you, you refer to amaros and bitters as salt to way to, to food. Is that? Bitters more than Namaro. Um, so bitters, tincture bitters, are the ones you see in the little bottles, uh, like Angostura, you know that one? It's got the oversized paper label and the bright yellow cap. Uh, that's been their trademark forever. 
Um, those ones you don't drink by the ounce, you use by the drop. And those are, I always say, you, you know, pretty much on the head. Um, well, first of all, I always say, I used to be a chef, now I just make chilled soup. <laughs> and to that end, uh, if the cocktail is my soup, then the bitters are the seasoning. Okay. I don't eat unseasoned soup, I'm not going to serve you an unseasoned drink. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Um, but then the potables, those are just your components to the soup, you know, uh, and they can run the gamut of flavors. You know, we've, we've got things up here that are earthy and smoky. We've got things up here that are citrusy and bright. Uh, we've got things up here that are uh, umami and almost meaty quality. Uh, you know, the ferroquinas that we have are very irony, you know. It's almost like, uh, I say it's like sucking on a car key. <laughs> you know, it's got so much minerality. Um, yeah, so those the, the potables are more the components of the okay. soup, and the bitters are the seasoning. All right, and then uh, just our last follow-up question before we really get into it, but uh, you have a method for distributing bitters. Can you tell me a little bit about the the four dash sure. versus to get a perfect uh, measurement of bitters? I, don't, I, w I wouldn't call it perfect, Tim, <laughs> but it is standardized, okay. and that's what matters. So when I'm looking at what's called a woozy bottle, which would be like the Angostura bottle uh, that's got a dasher built into it, uh, that shape of bottle is called a woozy, which is a fun fact to have. Uh, the little thing that, that uh, restricts it is called an orifice restrictor. That's not as fun a fact to know. Um, when I have the woozy bottle, which would be something akin to this one, which, which is my bitters, um, what we do at my bars, uh, for one dash, it's over and a bounce. So two strokes, right, uh, for woozy bottles. For your eyedropper style five ouncer, it's one third of the dropper. Okay. For the two ounce, uh, these are all kind of standard mm -hmm. sizes. For the two ounce, um, it's a full half of the dropper. All of those are roughly equal. So now I have a standard. Okay. And then as far as the droppers go, of course you can look if you want to adjust. But when we're using a woozy bottle, this gives us the opportunity to say, you know what, this drink just needs a half a dash. Or this drink needs a dash and a half. Gotcha. Right, so we've got a measurement. The way that I kind of reconcile it for people is I say, I may have a watch that tells the wrong time, but it still tells time, right? Exactly. I've standardized the measurement for all of my houses. Guys like Don Lee have gone out there and done all the deep research to figure out what a dash exactly is, and they came up with a dart dash, which is a, a, a screw cap that you can put on a woozy bottle that, that limits the flow and exactly. the, even more, and they that's the, that's the measured, you know, metric dash or whatever. Um, and that's all well and good. But for my teams, that's not something I can do to, um, I don't know, speed service along and keep keep the drinks flowing, which is our goal. Um, so we just, I came up with this standard by sitting down and measuring all those things and making sure that they are pretty much equal to one another. And then now we have a standard of which we can go by and we can move from there. So when I write down a recipe for my team and I say a dash and a half, they know exactly what I'm talking about. That's awesome. Uh, through my social stalking, I mean research of you, uh, that's the one thing that I found out, and that's one thing that you have taught me. So, like, that's, again, not a bartender. I just, I'm a terrible, terrible barman. I'm just good at this side of the bar. But uh, when I do my stuff at home, like the, the dash and the bounce, so like that, that is what I've been uh, practicing. And now knowing that it's called the woozy bottle even more. So. The, woozy, the woozy bottle and the orifice restricted. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's question one, so cheers to you, my friend. All right, so I'm to drink two. Question two: What are we drinking? Uh, this is a longtime favorite here at Amore Margo. It's called the Di Pompelmo, uh, which means of the grapefruit in Italian. So it's uh, kind of grapefruit juicy. Uh, you know, by far the juiciest drink on the menu. Even though we don't use juice here, it's got uh, three types of grapefruit coming at you: one from Aperol, one from Citron Sauvage, one from hopped grapefruit bitters. Uh, some nice wetness from uh, Cocchi Americano. And then uh, the backbone here is a bit of uh, Blanco tequila. So this is our analog to a, 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 a Paloma, sort of. Okay. Right? And uh, we have it on tap, though it's only pushed out at five pounds of pressure, so it's a flat cocktail uh, by design. Um, uh, we always have one flat and one bubbly on tap. This is our flat. Awesome. Well, cheers. Cheers to you, bud. The Deep on Paloma. Mm. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, we've been uh, coming in next month we'll be 11 years old and this has been on the menu since the second menu so this drink is probably ten and a half years old ish uh, mm. yeah again so so tasty that we moved it up to the tap and just because we crank out so many of them that's awesome all right so then on question two uh, you've been quoted in saying that teaching is learning yeah. 
What is the hardest lesson that you've learned so far in the bar business? The hardest lesson? Man, uh, that's a great question. I'm gonna ponder it for just a second. I don't think it's the hardest lesson I learned, but it is a very obvious lesson. Uh, and that lesson is, uh, you have to take your ego out of it, you know? Um, even though I have a space that is designed really like me. <laughs> I mentioned earlier, we don't use any uh, juices, we don't, everything is, I mentioned earlier, everything on the bar is alcoholic. For 22 years, I've only drank water and alcohol. I haven't had a cup of juice, milk, soda, tea. <laughs> so this certainly is my ego, but I know how to design drinks using these things that maybe even aren't to my taste, that are winners um, and that have long lasting effect. And I would, I'm not even embarrassed to say, this is one of them. This drink is not to my taste. This drink is a killer, and people love it, but it's not for me. Gotcha. It's for the people. I didn't open this place up to make stuff for myself. I mean, I kind of weirdly did. But once we got to the place where we decided that it was here to stay, you know, in the beginning we were kind of a clubhouse. We closed back in the beginning at 11 o'clock at night because we knew we all had other jobs. <laughs> this was a pop-up. <laughs> yeah. And we were like, my night off is the night I'm working here, right? Yep. And so we are like, well, let's close early so we can still have a night off. Um, so it was definitely a clubhouse in the beginning. But once we realized we were going to stay, we definitely changed our sort of stated purpose a bit and became more accommodating, obviously, open hours later, being more, you know, packing more people in here. In the beginning, we were sort of like restrictive, you know. Now we're like, get them in here. Let's show them what we do. Um, so I think taking your ego out of the situation is huge and plainly obvious, but maybe not so much... Um, Maybe not, not enough people do it. Okay. So that was a, uh, that, I don't know, again, if that's my hardest lesson. If I had more time to think about it, I'd come up with a hard one. But, like, that certainly rings true. you got to take your ego out of it. That's probably the best advice you can ever give anybody either because the com your customers, like to this, customers love this drink. You don't like it as much. So, therefore, it still stays. I have 11 years strong on the menu. Yeah, 11 but, years. This is probably the fifth one of that. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, so like, uh, <laughs> Off of that, I mean, I think that that's really great advice. So, almost going back to what you said with the, you know, sushi restaurant making a burger, like that's kind of, again, giving the people what they want, if you will. Sure. Like that, that's kind of. I mean, to that end, <clears throat> and again, I know I'm super hyper focused and hyper specific here at this bar, but we try also to, my team and myself, and it's been very difficult during the pandemic because hours have changed, places have closed, teams have moved on, etc. But I try and consider myself the concierge for my neighborhood. So when you come in here, if you've stumbled in and it is absolutely not for you, I'll generally try and get what it is you want out of you, and then I'll point you there. Hey, you've come to my burger joint and you're looking for sushi. Takahashi's next door. Yeah. Go get it. It's great. Tell them I sent you. <laughs> you know, because they'll send me people too. Yeah. Um, and I often tell my teams, a little unrelated to your question, but it seems germane. I often tell my teams, um, there are going to be people who come in here and do not enjoy their drink. But if we can show them a good time, they'll go out and they'll bump into their friend who they know would love us, and they'll tell them about us. Right? There are going to be folks who come into your sushi bar, your, your burger joint, and not have the greatest meal of their lives. But they're going to say, my friend Tim would love this place. I'm going to, Next time I see Tim, I'm going to be like, hey, have you been to this place? And he's going to come. So I'm okay with those sort of like, a calculated failure, you know? Um, because I know that, you know, I say this to my teams all the time, Amori Margo, just like everything else on earth, isn't for everyone. So let's show them what we do, and hopefully, even if they don't like it, they'll still have a positive experience that they can share with someone that they know who would love it. Do you think that uh, with being 11 years in, do you think that there will be, ever be a restructure or rebrand, or do you think that, that you get, like, oh, our neighborhood is changing, and you, you kind of re... I mean, never say never, and things that work don't always work forever, right? And and that's good. That's growth and change and experience. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, but until we get to a place where our popularity wanes, we're going to continue strong with our ethos. And I think that's what, 
you said the word branding, right? I think that's what makes a brand. Yeah. You don't deviate too much from what it is you do. Absolutely. You know, if I started saying like, oh, now we also sell peanut butter. Like, that's just, what does that have to do with anything, you know, that we do? So I wouldn't say never because times do change and things change. But currently we're doing well. We've expanded during the pandemic into the space next door. Um, a little bit back to the first question, the origin story. This room is 240 square feet. I mean, you're, the camera angles probably see most of the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. um, when we saw it at first, it was the dry storage for this attached kitchen through those double doors that was behind the bar that was out front. We came in here effectively and said, you have a huge basement, move your dry storage downstairs and we'll pay you every single month to be in here. And they were like, yeah, <laughs> right? So we built the bathroom, we built the bar top and we go. Um, but again, it was expected to last a short amount of time. Flash forward 10 years later, nine years later, almost to the day, um, the pandemic strikes. The business out front didn't make it. So in this sort of analogy, I'm renting a room uh, in a house and the owner passes away. Well, I've either got to move out too yeah. or buy the house. Yeah. So we bought the house. Nice. So we've expanded into the space next door. Um, we've always offered uh, a line of retail. You know, we sell books, bitters, barware. Um, so we've expanded that, or at least the op offerings, because we only used to have these little shelves around the room. And I would have to have a brand up until it was gone, and then I have another brand, you know, like Scrappies, and then yeah. I'm going to pull it down, put up 1821, then I'll pull it down. Now I've got a room that I can put them all up at once. Nice. Variety, yeah. choice, stunning looking, corner, storefront. And we put another, almost exactly this, with the same tiles and the same look in there. Um, so now we have two bars next door to each other that are effectively the same. So not only we are, are, are we not changing, we're growing the same thing, which is great. And again, until it gets to a place where it doesn't have as much patronage or as much uh, loyalists, we have so many loyalists after so long, um, until that changes, we don't change. And then here, two. here, because we yeah. have an opportunity to open other things. Yeah. If I come up with an idea, like, you know, hey, let's go open a Mexican place and just do tequila and mezcal. Let's, we find a space, we do that. That's. So and then two, like, because uh, again, getting back to the branding kind of stuff, your, your branding is consistent, is that, on purpose, or do you guys have a, t a team, or a like... team of one? Her name is Natalie Check. Uh, she's been with us uh, since year two, um, and uh, I've been dating her all that time. Okay, so she's, <laughs> she's my go-to. Right. She designed the original I Heart Bitters pin. She designed the, our iconic signs that we keep that now we've made into T-shirts. Yep. Um, the book. She did my cover for my book. She did the cover for my uh, bitters, um, and it, her style and mine mesh very well. Uh, or the look of, for this place. She does work for us for other places too, and they all have different looks, right? But uh, uh, her style has become part of the icon of this place. You know, she did the logo, Amore Margo, Bitter's Tasting Room. She did all of the artwork in the store, which is gorgeous. It's just incredible. So uh, her aesthetic matches, luckily. It could have yeah. not, right? Yeah. She could have been like a graffiti artist. <laughs> And then I would have had to find someone else and it probably would have been piecemeal because you get someone you have them for a year yeah. and then they go away. But she's been in my life all this time and every time we have something he's doing, it goes to her. Nice. I guess the, the follow-up of changing, because uh, here, again, everything is stirred drinks. But even in the book, you have a little bit of shaken drinks. Oh, for sure. So that I guess that's where I was kind of getting at that question. Do you think you'll ever bring shaken drinks into here? Or? Not here, and I think it's simply because of the back bar, okay. right? Uh, you don't shake drinks that don't have juice in them. Right. We don't have juice. No need to shake. Uh, that decision didn't necessarily grow directly out of a plan. That decision grew out of necessity. In the beginning, we had this space, 240 square feet. I've got a two-door low boy, and one of them's got two kegs inside of it, so I've got one door. Yeah. I don't have any room for anything else. You know, people always ask about my glassware. You saw the glass we drank out of before, it's yep. a tall one, and then there's this one. That's all I've got. There you go. Because I don't have space. Uh, you know, would I love to have the right glass for every drink? Would I love to have coops and tulips and flutes? And I just don't. Yep. I can't. Um, so in the beginning, that was born out of sheer necessity. Um, as we got going and realized that this is where we want to dig our heels in and have that ethos that we talked about, um, it just became natural. Um, and we stuck to it all along. So here, that'll never change. In the book, you know, I'm, I'm also a bartender. I'm not just Amore Margo. As mentioned, I had Windmill. We shipped yep, drinks yep, there. Yep. I had Blue Quarter. We opened the second Amore Margo in Brooklyn just before the pandemic, so it didn't make it. Honey Beans was all American whiskey, mm -hmm. beautiful drinks of all variety. Again, using all the tools we don't use here. You know, we've got a 
you know, making our own stuff in a rotary evaporator, got a centrifuge, I'm clarifying juices, like all the modern techniques I do at all the other places. This one lives in this zone. Awesome. Well, I think that's perfect wrap up to question two, and that was fucking delicious. So that was... <laughs> all right, on to question three, drink three. Round three. What are we drinking? This is another iconic drink here at Amore Margo. It's called the Sharpie Mustache. Okay. And we serve it exactly as you see it in a flask with a twist of orange. Sharpie Mustache created by Chris Elford. Um, again, in maybe year two of Amore Margo's existence. He's one of my dear friends. Uh, now lives out in Seattle, owns several bars of his own. He's awesome. Um, the Sharpie Mustache is an equal parts cocktail, which I love those. Uh, it has Maletti Amaro, which is a cola nut Amaro. So it's kind of got this cola vibe. Um, uh, it's got Bonal Gentian, which is an aperitif wine that's going to give it sort of the juicy angle. Uh, it's got London Dry Gin, which is going to bring some herbs to the party, and then uh, 100 Proof Rye Whiskey, which is going to bring some spice, so herbs and spices. Uh, and then it's got a bit of tiki bitters, which are more spices like nutmeg, mace, and ginger, with an orange twist. So we say this one's kind of like a weird Manhattan and a Negroni amalgam uh, that tastes a little bit leathery and spicy. All right, cheers. cheers. Now let's hold the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotta get your mustache on. Uh, excellent. Wow, okay. <laughs> the thing Fuck, about, wow. Yeah, the thing about this drink is when Chris presented it to me as a potential menu option, uh, he handed me a drink in a glass. We didn't do it in the flask from the very beginning. But he handed it to me in a flask, uh, and as I was sipping on it, I said, give me the rundown. And he said pretty much what I just said. It took me about 30 seconds to say it, and at the end, I was done. <laughs> and I said, wow, this drink... Uh, it's really easy to drink considering how potent it is. I feel like after two or three of these, I'd have a sharp. I'd wake up with a sharpie mustache. <laughs> Again, back to your days of uh, living with uh, five guys in Florida. You pass out and you get drunk with sharpie. Yes. So yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's awesome. That's I mean, and this is fucking delicious. So yeah, they go down oh. pretty easy. Mm. Uh, and people always ask. They see it on the menu and they're like, "Why whiskey and gin?" And I'm like, "Again, my chef speak comes out." And I go, I don't think of them as rye and gin. I think of them as herbs and spice. Would you put herbs and spices in the same dish? And they're like, of course. And I'm like, enjoy. And then uh, Old Overholt is your rye? Or is uh, and it... this one is Rittenhouse. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, Rittenhouse uh, uh, and Beef Eater. Gotcha. You know, it's uh, interesting here. Uh, we, we, because of our ethos, we promote bitters, amaro, and vermouth. So my menu reads as I just said it. Menu says... Maledi Amaro, Bonal Gentian, Tiki Bitters, Rye, Gin. We don't promote the brands. Yeah. We just want people to focus on those. Well, so I guess off of that, I, again, we, we talked a little bit in the very beginning, but you're out building an empire. Uh, what do you yeah. do to stay, I guess, inspired? Like, to keep that going? Like you said, like you had the windmill and... Uh, so, like yeah, that. So, so windmill, honeybees, and blue quarter all got taken away by the pandemic. But which we're still in. I like to remind myself and the people around me, you know, we're still yeah. in this thing. Um, but we restructured the company and I got absorbed in uh, in a deeper way. So uh, of those that I just named, Honeybees and the, uh, um, I didn't even name the second Amore Market, it only lasted four months the pandemic came and it wiped it right out. So I was a partner in those and this, um, but my partner now, Robbie Durassi, he expanded the, uh, uh, he had all of these bars and restaurants that were all separate LLCs. Now they're all under one umbrella, and I'm now partner and beverage director for the whole thing, which is called Overthrow Hospitality, we say. Eat, drink, start a revolution. Um, and we have 10 different concepts right here in the East Village um, that are all just blocks away from each other. Not all of them are bars, um, but several are. Uh, so that's how I keep inspired, because they're all different. We're not out here to try and open the same thing over and over. We're out here opening different things every time. And so even in just the past few months, we expanded it more, so we had to change the menu and do some different things. And we, and because of the pandemic, we have outdoor seating, which we call loggia or lodge by Amore Margo. So we've got these little lodges outside, which you can sit in and yeah. have, we're doing hot drinks out there, which nice. we've never done before. We opened Cafe de l'Enfer, which is our all absinthe and champagne bar in a very sort of Victorian goth era theme, you know, lots of crushed velvet and uh, reds and blacks and a lot of melted candle wax and skulls. And there's a six foot gargoyle sitting up uh, up there. Uh, we opened Eteria, which I mentioned, all tequila and mezcal. Uh, we opened Soda Club, which is all, uh, it's an all natural wine bar, but it features um, delicious house made pastas. And then we have 
Proletariat, which is our all beer bar, Lady Bird, which is our tapas restaurant, Avant Garden, which is our sort of flagship restaurant, and by the way, all of our spaces are um, vegan. Yeah, that's pretty, awesome. It's pretty incredible. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, uh, and we've been doing that for some time. Robbie has been doing that for some time, and it's really great to see other places of note getting on board. You know, Daniel Hume over at Eleven Madison, yep. Turn, yep. the best restaurant in the world, went vegan. Yeah, that's a big statement. Yeah. So you know, we know that this is one of the very correct paths to be walking down, and we're happy to be walking down at the at the front of the pack. Awesome. Well, uh, I guess after that, uh, just one quick follow up question, which is. Uh, uh, I find rather funny because again, you don't take any time off. You're, uh, I've been told you're a workaholic. Yeah, and, and but so if you were not working, what would your drink of choice be? My drink of choice? Yeah, you know, like if you're on, let's just oh. say you're on vacation or whatever. Okay. But like oh, I you're you already, I know, I know exactly the answer. Um, I would say this unequivocally. If you say the word vacation, I see in my mind a beach. Okay. Right. I'm not. A, I'm not going to the mountains. I'm probably not going walking around in you know Rome. I'm. I'm going to a beach. Gotcha. Uh, and if I'm on a beach, I want a swizzle. Okay. Like, that is my... If I'm at a bar... It, right now, if we were at a bar and someone walked by with a swizzle, I'd be like, give me one of those. I might only need one, but it's the drink I gotta have. Uh, you know, you have those things, right? Yeah, like, I go to the restaurant and I see a, a, an item on the menu that, that I gotta have. I, I, I must. You know, so same same goes with the bar. I see, gotcha. I see a swizzle, I have to have one. Excellent. Com- not, it's compulsory. Not a Mountain Suze? Not a Mountain Suze. <laughs> that drink... Um, drink we can hardly call it it's a highball yeah. um that came out of a, just a funny conversation that some friends of mine and i were having during the pandemic uh um i, I had to move i got evicted <laughs> i got evicted and the apartment that i moved into uh luckily first time in my entire time in new york 20 plus years that i have a backyard that's private first time i have a backyard much that also private so i bought a grill immediately and then i had my pod so just a select group of us uh, we keep it small six of us uh, and one of my friends was over, and we were talking about how there are a lot of like square peg, round hole drinks out there that you just make because it's got a cool name. Yeah. You know, the Ferrari, Fernet and Campari. Not that great. Yeah. <laughs> but a cool name. Uh, and we talked about how Jim Meehan pointed out in his book, uh, The Meehan Manual, that um, he said uh, a drink's only marketing campaign is its name. And that's why you have plenty of terrible drinks out there with great names, and we've probably lost just as many great drinks that have had terrible names, yep. and we just don't remember them. Um, so uh, somebody at the table, I know exactly who it was, I don't want to call them out, uh, said, Mountain Mountain Dew and Sue's, Mountain Sue's. And all of us were like, that sounds ridiculous. Except for me, I was like, that citrusy and bright, grassy and sharp, this might work. Uh, and it, honestly, it took me two months Every time I went into a bodega or, or whatever, it was still a pandemic, so we weren't going many places. Right, right. But every time I went into a bodega, I was like <clears throat> looking for Mountain Dew. Mm-hmm. And it's not a, I guess Pepsi doesn't have as much a foothold in New York as, as you might think, because it's a Pepsi product. So I couldn't find it for right. quite some time. Uh, and finally, I brought home a bottle, and I had a bottle of Sue's at home, and I made it. And uh, there's a video, I put it on my mm-hmm. Instagram. And my reaction is my reaction. Yeah. I was shocked at how good it was. No, it, was, it, it made me make it. So, like, yeah, that was, <laughs> I gotta tell you right now, if it was on a menu somewhere, I'd be tickled to see it, but I probably wouldn't order it. But if I'm in my backyard in the summer and it's hot and I'm out there grilling with some friends and someone just hands me one of these things, I'm drinking it. Excellent. It yeah. is very drinkable. It's low ABV. You can crush a bunch of them all day long. Um, in the end, probably too sweet for me. So you know the balance would have to be a little bit different. But the flavors work. Yep. And you know, and then not too long later, uh, now uh, Baja Blast, Baja Blast, Blast. <laughs> yeah. has come out with a, with a, uh, you know, a, a seltzer that's alcoholic. Yep, I, I saw that you want. Yep, yeah. which well, the, like, where's your credit? You need the credit, so uh, PepsiCo. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, that's question three. So, man, we're buzzing through. We're buzzing through. So, I'm, I'm, I'm getting buzzed through. <laughs> to drink four question four almost done not even close to midnight yet <laughs> but uh what are we drinking uh this is this classic old-fashioned uh, obviously not a drink i invented but a drink that i do feel that i have perfected in my sphere in my world anyway um we use uh cane syrup from martinique it's the only uh sugar we use on the bar we only use it in old fashions um the thing i like about that stuff is that they lay the cane out in the sun for a few days before pressing it uh and then when they juice it and reduce it it uh 
takes on almost tea-like quality. So it's not just a sweetener, it does bring a flavor as well. So uh, we barely glaze the bottom of this six and a half ounce glass with that. And then we go in with a dash each of Angostura and Regan's Orange Bitters. Uh, two full ounces of Old Overholt Rye Whiskey, the longest continuously produced rye whiskey in the world, and our favorite. Uh, three cold draft cubes are going to crowd this glass, which you, what you want for an old fashioned. Uh, a gentle stir, not too chill or dilute, just to combine. And then a lemon twist. And this is the old fashioned Edamore Mario. Excellent. Cheers. And probably my ride or die drink. Mm. Mind you, uh, not our fourth question, but uh, I, I've been told that this is your litmus test for drinks. Kind of, yeah. It's like uh, going into a, a bar. Uh, I think the onus is on you, the drinker, to make an informed decision based on the environment around you about what you're going to drink wherever you go in the first place. I find it difficult to believe that there are still folks out there who, who just like I described earlier, they're going into a sushi place and ordering a burger, or a burger place and ordering sushi, whichever way you want to read the analogy. Uh, and they don't read the room, and they're trying to, well, you know, I love a, I love an aviation, so I'm going to order an aviation at a bar that has absolutely no business making yep. you an aviation. But because it's hospitality and service, they're going to try. Yep. And it's going to be bad for you and for them. They're, they're going to be frustrated. They're going to be trying to look up a recipe. They're going to be trying to put it together with things that they don't have that are close. Look around the room. So if I'm at a bar that looks to me like I see jiggers, I see them using them, I see tools that make sense to me. Uh, and, and I haven't been there before, I usually will order an old-fashioned while I peruse the menu. Gotcha. So it's uh, a little bit of litmus and just a little bit of a starter. Gotcha. Right? If I have an old-fashioned in my hand, I can peruse your menu, make an informed choice about what it is you're doing here. But yeah, old-fashions are, and well they should be. Yeah. This, is a, this, this is a drink that any bar that's purporting to make cocktails should be able to make with a plum and quickly and efficiently, and it should be beautiful because they should have been making them all the time already, right? And again, it's three ingredients. It's not hard to fuck up, but like... You so made, say you. Yes. Where have you been and had a terrible Negroni? Yeah. Three ingredients. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, again, it's deafness of hand. It's are they practiced at this? Yeah. Uh, is the remove in the fridge? Uh, is the, has the remove been open six, eight months, six, eight years? Yeah. You know? Do they is think, it dusty on the shelf? Do they think that bottle of Angostura is some weird brand of Worcestershire? Yeah. You know, like, you know, you got to figure that stuff out. Yeah. Read the room. Uh, all right, well then on to question four. Uh, four. You uh, recently just came out with your own bitters. I did. And bitters back in the day was a cure-all until yeah, the right. FDA got involved and said, you can't actually say that. But if they didn't do that, what would your bitters be the cure-all for? <laughs> sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> These bitters cure sobriety. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know... Uh, liver spots. You know? <laughs> there, you're right. So we had peripatetic vendors that were roaming the streets in their wagons that you see, you know, in, in movies depicted in movies, and they pop up, a, you know, a little display or what have you, and they get up on a soapbox and they do a little, you know, barking and shouting and, and telling you, and they could claim whatever they wanted. Yeah. It cures liver spots and balding and impotence and you know cancer. They could say whatever yeah. they wanted because there was no governing body, um, and there were dozens of them. These were snake oil or tonic salesmen, right? Uh, and then the FDA is uh, created, and the FDA said, absolutely, Tim, you can say whatever you want about your bitters as long as you can prove it. Poof, they all disappeared, with the exception of maybe Angostura, yeah. um, Peixos, uh, Abbott's, because they never made any other claim except our bitters are delicious, which, of course, is subjective and can't be governed. So, yeah, there are many, many bitters and tonics that came and went because the FDA was, and it's, and it's a good thing, yeah. not a bad thing. Because a lot of those things were, you know, made of kerosene and dirt. And yeah. Because these guys would roam into town, tell you that it cured everything. They'd have a plant in the audience that was like, I took it and I'm, you know, I'm yeah. six inches I'm taller. I'm talking yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then they'd pack up their shit and go to the next town and you never yeah. see them again. Yeah. So it was a good thing that that came along. But that changed the, the sort of landscape of the bitters world uh, at that time. And Perfect. Well. And, they're, and they've come roaring back. As I said, I have over 500 and now I've made my own and I'm planning to make three more. Well, that was our, that was our follow up question. Now that you have the bug, if you will, is there more to come? So like, uh, so driftwood. Yeah, the camera. Driftwood was uh, supposed to be a one off. Every every year, I try and do something that's creative or or whatever to kind of keep my juices flowing. That I'll kind of launch around holiday season and hope that people will be interested enough to purchase it and use it. Um, 
and I did a lot of that during the pandemic. You know, I made a puzzle. I made these shoes. I, uh, um, uh, I, I cured salmon with fernet branca and whipped uh, branca menta into cream cheese and sold it as like a hard start bagel package. Uh, um, but this holiday season, I thought I'll make a bitters. I don't know why I haven't, right? right. So I got together with a team. Uh, I got them to send me a bunch of samples of the flavor. The flavor notes of this, by the way, are, are cinnamon and grapefruit, right? Because I was like, that's a common flavor in the cocktail pantheon. That's Don's mix. Cinnamon syrup and grapefruit juice. Thousands of tiki drinks have, you know, yeah. made, made or broke their reputation yeah. on that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I was like, why doesn't that exist in my world, in the bitter world? So I got them to send me several different cinnamon tinctures, several different grapefruit tinctures, and some other things to blend in. I did some blending, sent them all back. They did some blending, sent me back four. I did blind tasting with my teams and just kept score, and this was the one that won. Right. Um, and I only produced 500 bottles, thinking that that was just going to be my Christmas one-off, and I was never going to do it again. I didn't, or at least I didn't have any plans, and I didn't know that it was all going to sell. It all sold in, in 18 days. Um, and I think it would have sold faster, but supply chain issues, I didn't receive it until Christmas Eve, 20, 23, 23 mm -hmm. December, I got them. I was supposed to get them on December 1st, and I would have had like people buying them for the holiday. Right. At this point, people have already spent their holiday money. Yep. I think it sold slower than it would have. So, but still, 18 days is amazing. 500 bottles out of my house, you know, right. I'm wrapping them and signing, I signed every bottle, I numbered every bottle, um, uh, and packaged them up and shipped them out of my house. Uh, so that really opened my eyes to like, wow, people want me to make bitters. Uh, and the response from people who have gotten them and posted drinks and, and, and recipes that they're making using them is incredible. So I'm really psyched. So now we're already working on a second one. Uh, from now on, batches will be a thousand bottles, uh, so that there's a little bit more of a buffer. And I think, at this moment anyway, the plan is to do two a year for just two years, and then I'll have four that I've beta tested effectively, and if there's any tweaking needs to be done, we will. I think this one's gonna stay as it is, though. People love it. Uh, and then I'll launch that line as a line of four. We'll carry it in the store, we'll use them on the bar, we'll sell them to all of our own bars, and we'll sell them to the public. And then, uh when I posted that, you uh, you told me to get to work. Uh, what cocktail would go well with? Like, what what would you recommend making? That with so that? yeah, as I said, uh, cinnamon and grapefruit, Don's mix. So uh, in, immediately, what comes to mind for me, of course, is rum. Um, the first thing I made with them uh, is basically a cosmopolitan, but I used um, uh, hibiscus syrup instead of cranberry juice, and I used um, white rum, of course, instead of vodka, uh, and this was quite delicious. Um, but as I even say on the bottle, I'll, I'll read my own writing here, it says, uh, employ driftwood bitters to uh, enliven daiquiris, elevate old fashions, uh, cheer up margaritas, add mystery to martinis, and intrigue to Negronis. Right. The only way to misuse bitters is to miss using the bitters. So put them to work. All right. Um, I, I don't think, um, what I always say about cocktails to my teams is there's an absolutely a correct answer. There, however, are no wrong answers. Right? So if you say to yourself, do I think this grapefruit and cinnamon would go great in my next old fashioned? I say to you, why not? Sure. Oftentimes you're using a, um, a, a twist of citrus to finish your old fashioned. Well, this has grapefruit in it, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's citrus. And oftentimes you're using bitters like Angostura, which is cinnamon and cardamom. Well, this has cinnamon in it. And now you've changed one tiny thing and you've got a whole new drink. Right? So just put them to work. Perfect. Well, that's question four. Train has officially left the station, and yeah. we're we're rocking. So there we go. I'm starting to rock on this stool. There you go. Yeah. All right. So on question five, drink five. Our last question of the night, last drink of the night. What are we drinking? This is an absolute staple at Amori Margo. It has been on the menu since the day we opened, March 11th to uh, sorry, March 21st, 2011. Whew, buzzed. <laughs> um, so again, we're coming up on our 11th birthday. Uh, celebrated nine during the pandemic. We celebrated ten during the pandemic. It looks like we're going to celebrate eleven during the pandemic. Um, it had, it, it's our in the very beginning. We knew we were going to make lots of drinks with Amaro, which at the time was still not as common as it is, I think, today. So to plant our flag in that notion, we made this one, which has eight Amaro in it. Okay. So eight Amari, two different bitters, uh, uh, and the glass is rinsed with chartreuse. So it's built like a sazerac. So we call it the eight Amaro sazerac. Oh, excellent. Cheers. Cheers to you. Oh, wow. That's going nowhere. That's oh. going to, uh, that'll never go off the menu. Or we, should it? Wow. We, we Holy added, shit. That we, is fucking amazing. We've had to tweak it twice. Uh, 
uh, and people reach out to me sometimes. They're like, I found this recipe online, and I'm like, that's not the current one. Uh, we had to change it twice because things go away, uh, or you just can't get them. Um, but we, we but we're, it's never going anywhere. Do you have like uh, a list or like an axe? Like for the people that, that, for me personally, if I wanted some of the morals and whatever, like where would where should I go to get like? I mean, luckily, you and I, we live here in New York City. Right over here is Astor Wine and Spirits. Yep. It is easily the best liquor store in New York City, which means it's probably one of the best in the world. And they deliver to 46 states. Yep. So I would say first shot, okay. uh, Astor Wine and Spirits. Um, second to that, uh, I would say uh, just like you have a relationship with your bartender, who's, who's probably a good resource, I'm talking mostly to your viewers now, mm -hmm. you have a, res a resource in your favorite bartender, uh, he can maybe help you out by ordering stuff through his bar and maybe selling it to you uh, at, a, at a cost that's reasonable. Um, you should also have a great relationship with, you know, again, I was a chef for a long time and I was a butcher. You should have a relationship with your butcher just like you should have a relationship with your liquor store yep. owner. Yep. Because if you go in there enough, you become a regular just like you do at the bar and every now and again you get a free drink, right? You're likely never going to get a free bottle from the liquor store guy. However, if he sees you enough and he understands you enough and you say to him, can you get a hold of this product for me? He might be willing to risk buying a case knowing that you're probably going to take two bottles. Yeah. And even if no one else buys it, you'll probably keep picking it up until it's gone. Yeah. And he'll reorder it for you. Yeah. Make those relationships and make them worthy Amazing. for both of you, right? Some. That's, yeah. Great advice. Uh, when you move to a new city, I was always told that first thing you ever want to do is you want to find a bartender that likes you. So find a, find a bar, make it your home bar, and that's it. Yep. And then find a, a, a stylist, someone that cuts your hair. Like those are the two most important things. You need a bartender and a stylist because those two people will fucking put you wherever you need to go it's true. from the, the rest of you, like throughout your city. So like wherever well, you go. Those two characters in your life are very well connected. Yep. Uh, you know, they cut your hair uh, and then they cut, you know, uh, yep. the, the, the Chrysler guy's hair. And so then you know if you need a car, he's going to put you in touch yep. with him and there's yep. a connection there so you're going to get a lower price. and. You know, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's a stage advice too. Yeah. I, hadn't, I hadn't lumped in my barber, but I've been going to the same guy. His name's Jason. He's right over here, blind barber. Yeah, uh, that's the name of the place. He's not blind, although <laughs> today it looks like he is. But that's because I got caught in the rain. Um, Ice storm. A little bit, of right? Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, I've been going to him for I don't know. But I've been to New York for 21 years. I think I've been getting my hair cut by this guy for at least 15. All right. So question five. Drink five, already done. So question five comes down to the flip of the Whiskey Wednesday coin. Which you gave me. You can flip it, you can spin it, you I'm can do spin. whatever you want. The coin will give us the answer. You don't have to answer it, but I hope you do. Will Shower Juice ever make its debut? I don't know what you mean by debut, but my answer is fuck yeah. Let's see what the coin says. Fuck no. Shower Truce, uh, this is a dumb story, but I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I love chartreuse, of course. Yeah. My hobby, uh, one of my hobbies in the past, I used to make soap. Yep. And uh, I'm going to make a soap that has chartreuse in it so that it can have the, the lovely yeah. aroma. Uh, and I even thought to myself, I could make, a, I could also make a shampoo and a conditioner, and I could make one chartreuse and one jeune, the yellow, you know? One's more floral, one's more herbal. Yep. Um, but I didn't have any, uh, you need ventilated space to make soap because there's lots of fumes that are noxious and bad for you. Um, so I, uh, as sort of like a pneumatic device to keep myself remembering this, I put a bottle of chartreuse in my own shower. And then I started drinking it in the shower. Just a nip here and there. I would say, oh, it's like a little spa day. Um, Fuck shower beers, shower chartreuse. <laughs> right, and then when I lived with my very dear friend, who I'm gonna see later today, Chris Lauder, uh, he was my roommate for a short stint, we moved into a, like a brand new, kind of weirdly modern apartment, and it had one of those sh glass showers. Uh, and of course, I had my bottle of chartreuse in the shower. And a friend came over, another friend, and went to the bathroom. And when he came out of the bathroom, he was like, Is that a bottle of chartreuse in your shower? And I was like, Yeah, chartreuse. Doesn't everybody do that? <laughs> he was like, No, definitely not. And I was like, Okay, it's funny. So now, then I, my, one of my very good friends, Tim Master, is the national brand ambassador for chartreuse. 
Uh, I told him about it. I took a picture of myself in the shower with soap in my hair, sipping on chartreuse, and now I have a seven, uh, 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 500 milliliter, which they don't even make anymore, of the VEP in my shower. I took a picture of that, hashtag shower trues. And then other bartenders started popping up and doing yeah. short shower trues pictures, and it became this little thing for a minute. You know, this is kind of uh, still, I think, early days of, of Instagram viralness, yeah. but uh, but it popped up for a minute. And then my my buddy Alex, he had a bottle of chartreuse in his shower, uh, and, he, and the photo of his was two glasses. And I was like, oh, you you have people over. <laughs> Uh, and then he posted a picture of his robe, which was hanging outside the shower, and in the pocket was a little mini of Bekarovka. He's like, I got shower trues and bath <laughs> Uh So, goofy. But uh, now that I have a backyard, it could actually happen. I, I, had, was... I hadn't even thought about it, so that's a great question. There you go. I, well, can, I, I can make soap again. There you go. And then the... I, I just kind of think of you as the, like the Tyler Durgan of uh, the bar <laughs> world, where you're just like... Breaking into New York fat, uh, human fat uh, cells and uh, making uh, shower juice. So, next thing we know in the store will be like just little bars of soap, shower juice. I love it. Excellent. I love it. Yeah, I used to make soap and, you know, for use of myself and I give it to people as gifts. And I don't know, it's just a fun hobby. Our trues. There we go. It's coming back, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that's five questions down, five questions answered, five drinks. Wow. Not even close to midnight. Sir, thank you so much. That's some, that's some hard work, uh, yeah. but we're lucky to be able to get to do it.